Thanks, Erica. Yeah, excited to talk about this topic today because it's um, in all the work that we've been doing around gut health. I, I don't think I've come across this at all yet. And I think there's an awareness, but not nearly enough. So uh, we're going to learn some really cool things today and uh, see how we can help you integrate it into your gut health protocol. So uh, with that, I want to welcome Danny Granick. He is the CEO and co-founder of Bristol, and which is an or oral microbiome testing company, which focuses on helping people measure, understand, and improve their oral health. Danny earned a bachelor's in biochemistry at the University of San Diego before moving into a variety of commercial roles in genomic sequ sequencing, working at companies including Illumina and Oxford Nanoprone, Nanopore. Wow, you'll have to tell us more about that. During his time, he worked with companies leveraging genomics across consumer health, oncology, and synthetic biology. And Danny is located near me in San Diego, California. So really excited to have you um, and your company, Bristle. Very cool. Let me just uh, let our viewers know what the Bristle company is all about. Bristle is actually the first comprehensive at-home oral microbiome test to help people measure, understand, and improve their oral health. So our, the test identifies and quantifies all 100 or more unique bacterial species in a saliva sample, both beneficial and pathogenic, and it provides scores that are related to cavities, gum disease, halitosis, gut inflammation, and more. So based on the test results, they can provide some prevention uh, based information um, for diet, hygiene, and oral health care and product recommendations to help people to uh, improve their health. So each person that does the testing gets a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with one of, their, one of their oral health and hygiene experts to review and help understand the results. So this is really amazing. I, I mean, this is pretty um, groundbreaking in the microbiome world, wouldn't you say, Danny? Yeah, I think so. I actually, I mean, I loved, uh, Erica, your term whole biome. I think you said, it, you know, I think it's such a good representation because when we talk about the microbiome, I think a lot of the focus has been in rightfully so on the gut microbiome over the last couple of years. But the reality is, is that, you know, the body is a complex kind of dynamic space and we have a lot of different microbiomes for different parts of our body. We have a skin microbiome, there's a vaginal microbiome, there's uh, an ear canal microbiome. And, and just like all of those, we have an oral microbiome. And, you know, I think the, the really exciting thing is the technology that's been developed that's allowed us to start measuring and understanding exactly how these, these microbes interact with our bodies and how they influence health and disease, because it's another kind of angle that we can take when, when we try to improve our health. Um, and for us, you know, the oral microbiome has just been this completely unexplored territory. And, and I think oral health as its own category has been overlooked when, when we typically think about our, our health. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting about this that comes to mind for me is a, a lot of people are familiar with the Weston A. Price Foundation. And uh, I don't know if anybody knows the story behind that, but Weston A. Price actually had a son who died after receiving a root canal by him. So he gave his son a root canal and an infection um, began and his son died from it. And he began this whole crusade around health, um, starting from, you know, basically the knowledge around what happened to this root canal. So there's no question that the, that the mouth and what, uh, you know, your words, oral microbiome, but there's a strong connection to the overall body. And I think people are just starting to learn that. So, you know, everyone is familiar with that word microbiome now, but I don't know that everyone really knows what that means. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So, so the microbiome broadly is kind of the makeup of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live on or within our bodies. And, and like I said, there's uh, a lot of different environments within our bodies and each has kind of a unique oral micro or a unique microbiome that uh, performs different functions. So uh, in a typical microbiome, you know, as I'm sure a lot of people are familiar, like there's certain bacteria that, that are pathogenic and we think of those as kind of like infectious microbes that can cause or progress different kinds of diseases. And uh, something that a lot of people aren't aware of is that we also have beneficial microbes. Um, so, you know, 
the the microbes that you would find in a probiotic are a really good example of uh, bacteria that confer benefits to our health. And it's the balance of the, the pathogenic and beneficial microbes that kind of predisposes us for certain health conditions. And, you know, in the case of uh, an unbalanced microbiome, which we would call dysbiosis, your uh, but you basically have an overabundance of those pathogenic or harmful microbes and, and they cause damage to different parts of our body. So, you know, to kind of pull it back into a real world example, when we think about the oral microbiome, there are specific bacteria that produce acid and the acid decays the enamel on our teeth and eventually that decay gets so severe that it causes a hole in the tooth. And that's kind of what we know as a cavity today. Mm -hmm. um, and so for people with really bad cavities, it's really an overabundance of those bacteria that produces a lot of acid and causes that damage. And by understanding which bacteria somebody has in their oral microbiome and how much they have, we can kind of get an idea of their risk for certain conditions and, and also start tracking uh, and working on reducing the abundance of that pathogenic bacteria while increasing the abundance of those beneficial microbes that, that help fight off disease causing microbes, they help us produce, uh, you know, they help us digest certain foods and, and perform really important functions for our bodies that, that improve our oral health, but also improve our overall health. Yeah. So when someone is working on, you know, their, their gut microbiome, they know this well, or uh, Eric and I have talked about this um, ad nauseum really about how to improve the oral microbiome. So they have a good understanding of that in terms of, you know, um, variety of foods and, and, um, avoiding things that kill the microbiome. What does, what, what type of things affect the oral microbiome? Yeah. So that's been a really big question that we've, uh, been at the forefront of answering. I think, you know, when we think about dental care, which I view as kind of a separate category from oral health, dental care is all about removing disease or removing the damage of disease. So a cavity filling or a root canal kind of addresses the very latest stages of, of disease and the resulting damage of those pathogenic microbes. Um, when we talk about, you know, ways to shift the oral microbiome into a state of health, there's a lot of interventions that I think we've talked about, like brushing and flossing, we hear from the dentist all the time, right. but we don't fully understand like the impact of these practices on, at the microbiome level. And that's really what our companies focused on identifying. So we've been able to start stratifying different people's oral microbiomes. Let's say, you know, you have two people and they're both prone to gum disease, but it's being caused by different specific bacteria. One person may actually be a, a better responder to increased brushing frequency, whereas another person may respond better to, to more frequent flossing. And part of our goal is understanding how to match somebody's oral microbiome profile to a hygiene regimen and dietary and product recommendations that work the best for them. Mm -hmm. um, so we're uncovering a lot of these discoveries kind of from the ground up. I think there's the typical, again, like brushing, flossing, avoiding sugar that we've known for a really long time, but we're actually finding that there's really distinct differences in, in the impact that those interventions have based on the oral microbiome that, that somebody has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's interesting about the sugar. And when someone, you know, when we look at their gut microbiome, we know that we're learning a lot more about that, what their gut microbiome tells them in terms of their quality of health and any diseases that they have and inflammation. What is the connection? Like, what can we learn from the oral microbiome about our body? Yeah, so we... I, I always refer to the, the mouth as the gateway to the body and the mirror of our health. So it kind of serves two purposes. I think, you know, something we rare, rarely think about is just how connected our mouth is to the rest of our bodies and how much stuff like enters our mouth on a daily basis. Um, so in that sense, you know, there are situations where pathogenic bacteria in your mouth or bacteria that you're introducing through your mouth can migrate to other parts of your body. And we've seen that uh, affect gut health. We've seen it influence diabetes progression. Uh, there have been a lot of studies investigating the role of certain oral bacteria in Alzheimer's disease. We know that a lot of the bacteria in our mouths 
eventually make their way to other parts of our body and they can cause damage there. And then I think on the other side of the coin, we have this idea of the mouth actually reflecting problems that might be going on in other parts of our bodies. And similarly, uh, you know, a lot of diabetic patients experience uh, periodontal disease. So we think that shifts in the oral microbiome and shifts in oral health can actually indicate potentially early diabetes or prediabetes. And we know that, um, you know, pregnant women have much higher rates of, of gingivitis. So there's kind oh, wow. of a reflection there as well. Uh, and in that sense, you know, we're seeing that the oral microbiome definitely has this like bi-directional relationship with the rest of our bodies. And again, we're just starting to kind of understand the relationship there, but it's been really exciting to see. I think another really good example that we've been looking at is uh, there's a, a certain function in our body when we eat nitrate rich foods. So things like uh, spinach and our body reduces that to nitric oxide and nitric oxide is this really important compound that's related to uh, controlling blood pressure. So the more nitric oxide you produce the lower your blood pressure is and it's used in a lot of blood pressure medications and a lot of that activity actually happens in the oral microbiome as you're chewing those foods so what we found is uh that certain people who have a low abundance of the bacteria that perform that function actually correlates to higher blood pressure status and and i think it's a perfect example of that kind of direct relationship between oral health, the makeup of our oral microbiome and some of these systemic conditions that we might, you know, mm -hmm. be at risk for or experience later in life. So if someone has inflammation in their body, are they going to then see signs of inflammation in their, in their mouth? Yeah, I think in a lot of cases, it's definitely true. Like if you have inflammation or if you have dysbiosis in other parts of your body, you're certainly going to see either the signature or the the some kind of sign of it in your oral microbiome. And, and mm -hmm. I think in that way, a lot of oral health conditions are really kind of symptoms of, of other things that are going wrong in the body. Right. It's kind of like a check engine light. Right. Oh, that's a good way to look at it. You know, what's funny, um, when Eric and I started this podcast over a year ago, one of the first things that we decided we wanted to both do was a stool test because we said, ah, let's both do a stool test and compare it and, um, you know, review it on the show. And so uh, we did that and it was totally not a big deal, but a lot of people are really afraid of that. They're really put off by the, anything, you know, stool related for information. They're just not going to want to do that. So would you say that the bristle test is maybe um, a more user-friendly way of diagnostics around microbiome? Yeah. I mean, I think that it serves two major purposes. The first is clearly there's a direct relationship between the oral microbiome and oral health status. So you get those insights right away. And then I think when we talk about uh, the oral microbiome in the context of systemic health, or maybe even more specifically gut health, it can get you some of those, some of those low hanging answers, or at least point you in the right direction as to what might be going on in other parts of your body and kind of inform that next step. So uh -huh. for anybody that might be experiencing, you know, gut conditions related to gut dysbiosis, potentially a good first step is testing your oral microbiome, understanding, you know, whether or not you're seeing dysbiosis there and then taking that next step and maybe doing the, the stool right. test, because I do know that that's kind of a big barrier for a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, I did actually the bristle test. Um, I received a, a bristle test and I uh, got the experience firsthand. And I, it was incredibly simple. It was literally spitting in a little tube, no mess, no uh, hassle whatsoever. It took me about five minutes and then I put it in the mailbox and it was just so simple. But can you walk us through um, the process from the user end and then, you know, what happens on your end and what does the uh, information come back to tell us? Yeah. So as a user, um, you know, you would go to our website, bristlehealth.com, you get your kit in the mail. It, it kind of looks like a 23andMe kit or something that you would get from any DNA testing company. And like you said, it's, it's pretty simple. We, we have an online form that people fill out where we ask some questions around hygiene and kind of oral health history just to get the context of you as a person. And then you supply your saliva sample and it's literally just spitting in a tube and sending it back, I think one of the most common uh, kind of customer support inquiries we get is people double checking that they did it right because it 
it just seems so, it seems almost too easy. Um, so that's been kind of an interesting challenge, but you send your saliva sample back in the mail and then it arrives at our lab and we take it through, we won't get too detailed around this, but we take it through a series of kind of chemical processing steps where we extract all of the genomic material from the sample and then we use genetic sequencing. But instead of looking at your DNA, we're actually looking at the DNA of all of the microbes in your saliva. And mm -hmm. what that allows us to do is identify who's in there and how much of each there are. And we take that data, classify it, and we start to bucket it into the related indication. So, you know, depending on the makeup of your oral microbiome, you'll see which microbes you have that are related to tooth decay and gum inflammation and bad breath and gut dysbiosis. And we also pull out all of the beneficial microbes and we'll tell you the ratios of, of all of those microbes. And that rolls up into kind of your overall score. And then okay. based on your score, we're able to, to kind of pair you with different recommendations around products, diet, uh, hygiene recommendations that are intended to shift your microbiome into a more balanced state and kind of mitigate your risk for those conditions in the future. Mm -hmm. And that is really amazing. Like, yeah. And like you touched on, I mean, I think the last part is the the coaching with our, our kind of oral health experts. And that really helps people close the loop between kind of getting the information and then really implementing it into their lives. Yeah, I think that people oftentimes, you know, they love this ice, this idea of doing some sort of testing, but it's the use of the information where people often get stuck. And I see that often and where people are just like, okay, I, I have this information. I don't really know what to do with it. Um, but it sounds like the, the, the coaching session is really where someone is kind of gets that translation of like, okay, here's your information. Here's where you are now. And here's the things that you should work on. And here's the steps that you should take to work on it. So yeah, and I, the recommendations, you know, we, we give a lot of recommendations around what people can do, but I think that there's a gap between what you can do and what you're willing to do or what, what you want to implement at any given stage. Right. So, right. you know, maybe some of the dietary recommendations, I think a great example is it's easy for us to sit here and say, you know, cut cut out sugar to reduce your risk for, for cavities. But what if you're a diabetic patient? Like that recommendation doesn't necessarily apply to you. So we need to be able to kind of construct uh, a regimen that excludes that recommendation, but still gets them into a state of oral health. And, and that's really the goal of coaching. It's, it's closing the gap between the raw recommendations that we provide and the reality of, of somebody mm -hmm. as an individual. Yeah, this is really cool. I am really looking forward to uh, recommending this for my clients as a starting point because uh, almost none of them uh, want to do a stool test, but they all are interested in the information. You know, it's like, should I get labs done? Well, you know, it's not going to tell you so much about your microbiome and that's really the cornerstone of your health. Everything comes from the microbiome. So I think this is a really important shift that will help people. Erica, what are your thoughts? Are you, do you ever get people that ask about oral microbiome? You know, interestingly enough, I was just meeting with a client earlier this morning and he was asking me, um, he was DJing at night and he wanted to know when people came close to him, you know, because he knew he wasn't going to be able to be like doing mints or anything like that in the program. He was like, he was concerned about his breath. And I said, well, you know, do you, are you experiencing some halitosis? And he said, yes. And I was like, oh, well, we're going to have to look into that, but yeah. it's definitely not something that, you know, a lot of our, my clients know enough about just a microbiome, but they do forget to associate that there, we have different ones. Like Danny mentioned, you know, the, the whole biome is, is completely even beyond what we can even understand. And then beyond that, you know, the pH in our mouth is not the same pH in the bottom. So the microbiomes, they're called, you know, micro because they, they depend on their environment. And we have one, like you mentioned, in all those spaces and our brain even has one now. And so I think it is important to look at all of us and it would be so fun to just test all of them, right? And know who's there. Yeah. So I think this is amazing. I actually worked in the dental field for a very long time. And so um, it took me a while to give up a regular toothpaste and yeah, like be mouthwash. Like I'm like, I don't use mouthwash. Like that was, that was really odd. So, and my 
my dental health has been much better since I've stopped doing all of those things. So I would be really interested in doing these, this test. So is it something that you guys recommend mouthwash, toothpaste? What do, what do you guys feel in your recommendations for that? Yeah. So I think that's kind of the beauty of the test. Um, it's, it's going to be different depending on somebody's microbiome. I think there's also, there's kind of two components. I think it's, it's what we recommend, but it's also the specific ingredients that we recommend when we make a certain recommendation. So mouthwash is a really good example. Um, as a typical kind of patient or consumer, you know, you walk into a grocery store and of course you're told, you know, brush, floss, mouthwash, right? The three things that you probably want to have in your bathroom cabinet, but a lot of the mouthwash that is on the shelves is actually a pretty harsh antibacterial agent. And on the surface, it sounds great, right? It's like, uh, when you use Purell and they make the claim of it kills 99.99, whatever percent of germs, like that sounds great. But what a lot of people don't understand is that killing 99.99% of germs is also killing a lot of the beneficial microbes that, that are in whatever environment you're introducing it to. And by eliminating those, you, you may actually be putting yourself at greater risk for, for disease in the future because those pathogenic bacteria, if they're sticking around, have a lot more space to grow. Um, so I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about, you know, what, what traditional kind of recommendations are actually beneficial to oral health and maintaining balance in the oral microbiome. And then there's also a lot of misinformation around what ingredients are, are best. And we're starting to stratify how effective those ingredients are based on the oral microbiome that you have. So, you know, uh, a lot of debate around fluoride versus nanohydroxyapatite versus some other ingredients. And there's a lot that we don't know, um, but I think it's, you know, for as much as we don't know, I think the, the craziest thing to me is that nobody has ever really looked at the impact of fluoride on the oral microbiome until, you know, we started looking at it or the impact of nanohydroxyapatite. And we'll never really understand the impact of these ingredients until we look at it at that level. Yeah. And I think it's, it, it's worth mentioning to our listeners that fluoride was initially introduced to strengthen the, the teeth because they were noticing a lot of decay. And um, in theory, right? In theory, they say if you eliminate actual sugar from your diet, you technically don't need it because the, the sugar is actually feeding the bacteria that's causing that change in pH and therefore causing the cavities, as you explained in the beginning of the episode. So, you know, if you have a low sugar diet, you technically shouldn't have the pathogens in there that would be causing that. And you shouldn't require the fluoride and the fluoride to a certain degree causes a lot more issues. There is a lot of evidence out there for that, but yeah, I think that we haven't put enough thought and process into it all. But also you talked about dysbiosis and the pathogens and all of those things. And I wanted to circle back on that and really hammer it down for the people listening that the microbiomes is all about a balance. So we, we know we don't only have good bacteria, but we also sort of need the bad bacteria. It's this dysbiosis when it's unbalanced. So we don't want to eliminate everything. And that's why we don't want Sorry about that. That's why we don't want to just go in there and napalm with alcohol or with an antibiotic and all those things, because we're, we're killing the good and we're killing the bad. And we don't know who's surviving and who's going to take over after we do those kind of things. So it's major and it's super important for that. I you talked about, go ahead. That's a really good point. I mean, I think going off of that, you know, there's two kind of ideas that, that are important for a microbiome. It's the balance of good and bad bacteria, but it's also the diversity of the bacteria that you have in there. Um, so, you know, while, while you want to minimize the pathogenic microbes and maximize those beneficial ones, you also want a lot of different kinds of species because they all have their unique functions and you may be missing out on, on health benefits if you don't have, you know, certain species of bacteria there. And we talk, um, about probiotics and prebiotics often when we're doing our podcast, talking about the actual gut microbiome. So what are the things that we can do as a probiotic or a prebiotic for our oral microhealth. I know myself, I take that, um, 
MK, what is it? K12, M18 probiotics. So there are actual oral probiotics that you can take and you just kind of chew them and just leave them in your mouth and then not rinse them off. And they are known to um, help immunologically. And I don't know if you know enough about it to maybe tell us even more. Yeah. So the probiotic space is really exciting for us. I mean, I think the the other really cool thing about the mouth is that it's, it's physically accessible. So when we think about probiotics, um, the idea is that you're introducing uh, a concentrated amount of like a beneficial bacteria into, in this case, your mouth, right? And the idea is if I for lack of a better word, like napalm my mouth with beneficial microbes, it'll displace some of those pathogenic ones and get me back to balance. Uh, but probiotics, you know, there's, there's kind of levels of the efficacy and it's dependent on a lot of factors. So one is, you know, is there room for the probiotic bacteria to, to kind of land in whatever environment you want and then expand? Um, okay. Another one is, you know, depending on what your oral microbiome looks like now, K12 or M18 may be more or less effective for you. It's kind of, I think of it like a vitamin, right? If you're already getting your daily dose of vitamin C every day, you know, taking a vitamin supplement with like 2000% of your daily intake, your body is not going to retain all 2000%. And it's similar with a probiotic. So what we're able to do is based on your oral microbiome, you know, there's very distinct kind of factors where if you're low in bacteria A and high in bacteria B, that makes you a really good candidate for probiotic C versus being maybe high in A and low in B. And that makes you a better candidate for probiotic D. So we're getting to this personalized kind of precision medicine approach with probiotics where we're able to say with confidence that one's going to be more effective than the other. And the other exciting part about the mouth is that we can introduce hygiene changes that kind of displace those microbes and create a better environment for those probiotics to be more effective. A good example is tongue scraping as, as kind of like a hygiene regimen where you can physically start to remove some of those bacteria and create the space that the probiotic needs to do its job. I love that. I really, really love that. I think that the way you're speaking is how I all, almost always can get my clients to do the gut microbiome test because it's like, you know, right now we're shooting in the dark, right? So we can do all of these things and then take your lab work, which I, I agree with Nicole, like we can do lab work, but that doesn't tell us the face. It just tells how your body is responding to all of this stuff. So instead of waiting and seeing how your body responds and knowing what's in there and actually eating the right things or supplying yourself with the right uh, probiotics, it's just it's leap years. Like you're taking away so much time and guesswork out of it all. So I love how you're saying that. And I'm, like I said, I'm just going to have to do this really soon. <laughs> um, do you think that the oral microbiome is related to? Race or location where you're at, like, does it change when you change any of those? I missed, I missed the first part of your question, but I, I think I got the gist of it where maybe the oral microbiome is related to certain kind of demographic factors. Um, and I do, I mean, I think that it's, it's, you know, as we build out our database, we're starting to find more and more patterns and commonalities between different kinds of groups in, in their oral microbiome. But I think you can look at uh, just the rates of oral disease across the population and also get some insight I think socioeconomic factors, you know, the, the prevalence of oral disease in lower socioeconomic groups is much higher than that in socioeconomically higher groups. And, and I think that we're going to find really distinct oral microbiome patterns there. And I think, you know, the real opportunity that we have is oral disease. If we can rebalance the oral microbiome is largely preventable. So for those kinds of groups, like we can provide this massive benefit in uh, an industry in uh, an area of care where people are paying thousands of dollars out of pocket every year to treat disease. Uh, I think ethnically, we're, we're still looking into it. It's a really interesting question. I know that we see patterns in gut microbiome, 
profiles like across the globe. And I'm sure that we would see the same thing. And I would also imagine that it's largely influenced by diet as well. Um, so we're starting to, to collect a lot of the data around, you know, what kinds of diets and foods people are intaking and how that relates to the oral microbiome profile. Oh, this is all fascinating. I could probably sit here and talk to you for days about this in all honesty, I mean, for sure. So thank you so much for answering my questions. Yeah, no yeah. problem. I think it's going to be uh, really a part of the future of health, you know, when we, as people start to expand and more interest in knowledge is um, gained around the microbiome and what really that means. So I think you're on the right track. You guys are certainly trailblazing with the oral microbiome. What my last question is just, how did you get into this? Yeah. So, you know, I think part of it was like coming from the genomics industry, you know, I came at a really exciting time where sequencing was uh, kind of moving from this experimental, like research focused technology to clinical applications. And we saw it in, I think oncology is a really great example where, you know, for a really long time, the way that we approached cancer was we were characterizing it based on where the cancer was and like how big the tumor was. Um, so breast cancer, like, okay, you know, there's cancer like in somebody's breast, but uh, what genomic technology allowed us to do is get a lot more precise around what was driving the cancer. So we moved from characterizing it based on location to the mutations that led to the formation of the tumor. And that knowledge allowed us to create therapeutics that bypass the need for chemotherapy, which we can kind of relate to harsh antibacterials that we're using in our mouths today to uh, precision medicine, right? That, that we're targeting the specific drivers of cancer. And we've been using genetic technology to start detecting the earliest indications of those kinds of cancer from a blood sample. So there's been this massive transition in all of these different fields. Cancer is one example, but we've seen the same thing in cardiovascular disease, non-invasive prenatal testing, the gut microbiome space. And, you know, I think for a long time, I was always kind of looking for an area of healthcare that could be innovated using the technology that existed today. Uh, and to me, you know, oral health really just stood out as, as this system of care. And, and I think, yeah, just this, this system of care that has been uh, ingrained in the status quo for decades and hasn't really caught up to the rest of, of healthcare and the way that we approach health and disease and the, the technologies that we use. So, you know, the idea of applying it to, to oral health and care was, I think, obvious once we recognized, you know, that that was an area where we could make a really big impact. Yeah, I, I think you certainly will. So, we're really excited for you and thank you so much for your time today and coming on and telling us all about this fascinating field, looking more uh, forward to learning more about it. So uh, what can people do to get started? Yeah. So visit our website, bristlehealth.com. We have tons of educational blog articles, lots of content. If you want to get caught up on the oral microbiome and oral health itself, um, you can also get the kit directly from us. I'm sure that there's, there's a discount code that we have that uh, your followers can leverage. I can't remember what it is, but um, we'll be sure to share it. Uh, and then get your kit in the mail and, and we'll get you started on the journey to improve your, your oral health. Awesome. Love it. Okay. We will include those links below for you all to um, get yourself a bristle kit and get started. So thank you again for coming on today and thanks everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys. Thanks.